that are able to share this with us. So as I say, last time we met, Psalm 46 was where we were, uh, and that sense of things not as we would like them, um, things that were unusual for us and circumstances changing, and yet that reassurance that God is with us. Uh, as I've been preparing for Palm Sunday tomorrow, the psalm really that I've been looking at is Psalm 137. It says, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There in the poplars, we hung our harps. For there our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? Now, I've been reflecting on that as, uh, as I've been preparing for tomorrow to do just a short video. We do a 10-minute video, 15-minute video just to put online, just so that we can connect with folk. And I was thinking, you, you can't just do a normal Palm Sunday service. You, you can't just sing the normal Palm Sunday songs. It, it just doesn't feel right. And you catch that in this psalm. So uh, this psalm is... Uh, comes out of a time when the God's people were being carried off into captivity. Uh, and their tormentors are saying, you know, we, we heard you sing songs before, sing your songs. And they're saying, how can we sing those songs? How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? They're, they're trying to make sense of where they are uh, and of what their faith means to them in this situation and how God is with them or not with them or what God is saying to them. Uh, and there's a, a sense of th things are not just normal. We can't just do what we once did. We can't just keep on singing the same songs that we've sung. And so there is this lament that is there. We're not where we were and we can't, can't quite make sense of where we are just now and what God is saying in the midst of this. And in many ways, I think that's where we are just now. Uh, and it's a very natural place for us to be. It's a confusing place for us to be. And yet, as I hope we'll see today, it's a time also for us to be able to affirm that God is with us in this moment, even though we feel we cannot sing the same songs or do the same things as we would want. Let's just pray as we start, shall we? Lord, we thank you for the Psalms, for the way that they reflect so many different feelings and emotions at different times. We thank you for this Psalm that we've read together, for the way that your people were grappling with all that was going on for them, for the way it speaks into our situation today. And yet, Lord, help us to affirm for one another that you are with us that we might know that you guide and guard us through this time. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. One of the parts of teaching that we use on Path of Renewal has been about navigating discontinuous change. Uh, I spent some time looking at that because I realised that it actually maps onto our situation just now. So we talk about continuous and discontinuous change and how to lead in times of transition. And I hope that this will maybe begin to give you a bit of an insight into what we're going through at the moment and the ways that we're trying to cope with it. Continuous change is something that develops out of what has gone before. It can be anticipated and managed. It's just part of the normal course of things. And in general, we've got experience and resources to address this developmental change. It's usually just about improving what's already taken place. So in church life, it's what are the new songs that have been introduced? What are the things that we can take? And how can we manage this continuous change? Discontinuous change is disruptive and unanticipated. It creates situations that challenge our assumptions. 
Now, we would use this to say actually the, the change of where the church is today from where it was 20, 30, 100 years ago is actually discontinuous. But actually what we faced over the last few weeks has been quite dramatically discontinuous. We all recognize that. And actually the skills we've learned aren't always helpful in this regard. Sometimes they are. Sometimes the, the ways that we've actually coped with things, but we don't have all the skills that we need. So, yeah, how many of us have learned to use Zoom over the last few weeks? Yeah, I'm beginning to look at how I'm going to uh, get video clips and put them together. I'm going to have to get some software and do that. I'm going to have to upskill myself and do things that I haven't done before. And so there's a whole lot of stuff that we, we feel like a fish out of water in the midst of all of this. We're not exactly sure of what to do. And there's that sense of what Joshua said, we've never been this way before. We haven't got a, a book to tell us what to do. We can't pick anything up. It's not that uh, the powers that be in the central church can simply say to each of our churches, here's what to do just now. We can tell you exactly what to do. We have never been this way before. And we are struggling in the midst of that to cope with it. Some of the stuff that we uh, look at um, is talking about a journey of spiritual discernment and the ways that we do that and being on a, a journey towards a missional church. And I don't think that changes in the midst of the situation that we're in just now. And Alan Roxborough and others who write with him talk about being on this journey of spiritual discernment. They talk of, it, uh, of being, being in a boat and tacking in the wind is what they talk about so moving from one place to another but actually what you discover in the journey is that when you think you've just got to some place suddenly you find yourself back at the original place and the journey is not as straightforward as even this diagram would set out but what he talks about is five phases that we go through in that journey of spiritual discernment as we seek to listen to what god is saying and respond to what God says into our lives. These are the five phases that he talks about. Awareness, understanding, evaluation, experimentation, and then commitment. Now, he actually says that in normal course, he says allow a time scale of three years for that. But actually, we find ourselves in such a major change at the moment that we're having to try and manage all of this in a period of weeks. So in the normal course, we have time to work through all of this. At the moment, it almost feels like we're trying to do all of this at one time. And it is incredibly difficult to do. But I think having some understanding of actually what we're trying to do in the midst of this may be helpful for us as we work through it. So stage one, he says, is actually awareness. Awareness that the situation has changed. And as folk become aware of that, you need to give space for people to articulate their experiences and feelings. Uh, given the situation that we're in at the moment, folk, everybody almost is aware. Uh, you know, initially, folk carried on doing what they normally did. And then there was that growing awareness that actually it isn't business as usual. So folk became aware of that, but it's also about articulating our experiences and our feelings in the midst of all of that. That's why the last time we were together, I showed you these pictures and said, how are you feeling about what's going on? Because being able to express how we feel about things is actually really important if we're going to be able to travel this journey well. If we somehow park our emotions and say that they're not important, they will catch us out. How we are feeling through all of this is important. And so Roxborough points out that being aware of our situation, but also being aware of how we feel in the midst of all of this is actually something that's crucial. The next part of the journey, he says, is actually understanding. So it's creating a framework or a language to help people understand and speak about what is happening to us. So what is going on at the moment? How, how do we express how God is with us in this moment? 
How do we talk about what is happening? How do we find the language and the, the framework to do that? I'm not sure that's particularly easy for us, and I'm not sure that we've actually managed to do that yet. I do find folk beginning to do this, beginning to ask the questions about what's going on in the midst of this and what God is saying to us. And that understanding of where we are with God in the midst of this, I think is actually really important. I had some email conversations yesterday with Peter Nielsen, who was the author, uh, as you will know, of Church Without Walls. And he said this, it seems that God has put the foot on the accelerator so that we're plunged into fast moving rapids of change while we were sitting tentatively with our toes in the water. So much has been stripped away. Someone used the word dishevelling recently, beware of trying to tidy up. I love that image. I used to do a lot of canoeing and uh, on the points in the river where there are no rapids, you can uh, afford to sit back and just enjoy the view. But when you come to a fast moving rapid, you don't have any choice but to sit up and to make sure that you pay attention to what's going on. And it does seem to me that that image is important just now, but in fast moving rapids of change. But we need to heed Peter's words beware of trying to tidy up. So although we try to make sense of what is going on, actually we can't box it all just now and we can't give immediate answers to what is happening. And it's difficult in some ways to find the words. And I was aware this morning that actually, as I begin to do all of that, I actually often find myself back at the first stage and of having to handle my emotions. My son uh, yesterday sent me this video of my granddaughter. So that's my, my granddaughter and my daughter-in-law. And so Eden is learning to ride her bike. And so they sent me this video of her riding her bike yesterday. I found myself this morning looking at that almost in tears because I know in normal circumstances, Eden would be around at our house today desperate to show me her riding her bike. And I can't share that with her. It's dishevelling. It is disconcerting. It's a lovely video. Yeah, there she is on her bike. I want to see her do that, and yet at the moment, I can't. And yet there was something in that picture as well for me of, of God standing alongside me in this moment as I wobble on my bike. And yet God is with me in this moment. And that is really important for me. So we try to, to make some sense of all of this. And yet things break in that take us back to that place of this is just emotions that I am not in control of. And yet that I find so hard. So awareness, understanding, uh, the next stage is evaluation. And in the evaluation stage, we begin to ask, what are we being called by God to become and to do? What is it in this moment that actually we should be doing? And we ask the question, what experiments might be started to help us in this? And we're having to actually begin to do this before we finish the stages before. So in normal circumstances, you might manage to go through stage one and two before you come to stage three. So usually you'd have time over this. So you'd have time to explore with your Kirk sessions and other folk, what are the circumstances that we face just now? You'd have time to as well talk about this. What have we been called by God to become and to do? What experiments might be started? We'd, we'd spend months over talking at Kirk session meetings about what experiments we might do. But my guess is that all of our congregations have already started experimenting. We just had to get on with that in the midst of the change that we're in just now. So after the evaluation, you do the experimentation. We haven't had time to stop at stage three. We've actually moved immediately on to stage four. We're trying things out, we're seeing what happens, and we're learning from others in the process. I've been surprised how quickly folk have caught that 
Um, I heard the minister the other day, who would usually be someone who's very conservative and who wants everything worked through, uh, actually saying, I think we just need to try it and see what happens. And that's where we are just now, trying things out, seeing what happens, learning from others on the process. And one of the things I've been trying to do is to make sure that folk are in touch with each other. So that sense of just learning from what others are doing, although my advice in the whole process with folk has been not to see what others are doing and say, I must do that, but actually to say, I cannot do everything, but I need to do something, and I can signpost people to the things that others are doing. Now, I know that others have appreciated that advice, and I would give that advice again this morning. Don't try and do everything. So we at Lone Head are not streaming a Sunday morning service. We don't actually have the resources to do that unless I was really to stretch myself. And so what we do is a 10 minute video and then we signpost folk to services other places. So how do we learn from others in the process and yet not feel that we've got to replicate exactly what others are doing? It's different in different places. The final stage uh, he describes as commitment, which is actually simply about investing in what we see as being effective and authentic. And I think very naturally, again, we will do that. The things that folks say they're appreciating and getting something from, we will commit more time and energy to those uh, and we will take ourselves through that process. So these five things are what he talks about. They say simply that awareness of the situation we're in, but also how we feel trying to develop a framework for understanding it, evaluating what God is calling us to do in the midst of all of that, simply doing some experimenting, and then committing more time and energy to those things that we've been experimenting with that have gone well. So more words from Peter just as we, we finish this. I, I hope that has given perhaps a bit of a framework for understanding where we are just now. I think it is difficult because we're having to do all of these things at one time, and that is incredibly difficult. But something else that Peter said yesterday was this. At this moment, the darker days still lie at a distance for us, but the images of death and desperation in the media colonize our imaginations. It is important to embed ourselves in the deeper story of God's hidden purposes in the darkness and to be ready to hold one another steady through the days to come. Now these, I believe, are really important words for us. We embed ourselves in the deeper story of God's hidden purposes and we hold one another steady. And these things are going to be increasingly important for us in the days that lie ahead. Meantime, Peter said, let's learn to sing the Lord's song in this strange land. Sometimes a song of lament and sometimes of surprising joy. And I think that is the story at the moment. There, there is the lament, what we've lost. And yet in the midst of that, there are also things that we can give thanks for. Uh, and actually taking the time to spot those and to see those. Uh, one of the things for me has been seeing the way that folk in our community have responded to one another and are looking out for each other uh, in remarkable ways. Uh, yeah, it's, it's just great to see that happening. Um, we've got somebody in our community whose house went on fire recently. And to see the, the way that folk have responded to the needs that she has has been incredible. And so in amongst the song of lament and the sadness for what's there, there are also those moments of joy and of thankfulness for what we see God doing. And we need to also look out for those and to give God thanks for those moments, as well as those moments when we're finding things hard. I found those words from Peter really helpful. Uh, I hope you have as well. Um, let's just pray before we do our next part. Lord, we thank you for those words that Peter breathes into our lives and situations, into the midst of the darkness. Those words of reassurance that you are with us, that we might sing the songs of lament, 
and yet that we might also catch those signs of you at work, that we might also sing those songs of joy in those moments when you, we see you at work. And so we pray that you would help us as we seek as churches in different places to work through what we are to be and to do in these times. Guard us and keep us, we pray. In Jesus' name, Amen. I will unmute you all uh, in a moment. And the question I really wanted to ask uh, all of you was this. Yeah, if that is where we are at the moment, if we're being asked to tack in the wind and to do these things, then what is it that, where are we in that situation? Where are we in all of this? Is it about awareness, understanding? Is it evaluating, experimentation? or commitment to what is working. So I'll take that off so that you can see everyone again and I will unmute you all. Uh, if you're muted, it's because you've chosen to mute yourself rather than because I've muted you. Um, where do you feel you are in that journey? Uh, is that kind of picture helpful for you or actually are you so much all over the place that that really is not helpful just now. I would say I'm all over the place, but actually that diagram's helpful for me to realise that I'm all over the place. If that makes sense. Yep. I would say, well, I'm all over the place, but I think it is, I would say it's helpful to just maybe give you a bit of focus. Yep. 